Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Sharing me on social media and uh, following me is very, very important because I am a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising or anything else. And so <laughs> sharing me is the way that I grow. So please um, follow me on Twitter at SYLTales and share all of my videos. I would appreciate your support via a page on my website, SYLRanch.tv, and there is a link to that in my description box. So today on Tales from SYL Ranch, we have the Fandai Masters 110th anniversary review of Frankenstein 1910. So for new viewers to explain my show, Tales from SYL Ranch is a science fiction, fantasy, horror, superhero, and other genre-related review show. Sometimes I review serious films and TV, sometimes I review schlock, and sometimes I review modern films with a broad appeal, such as Star Wars movies, Marvel movies, The Orville, Doctor Who, and lately Batwoman, the modern Plan 9 from outer space. I no longer, however, review or even watch Star Trek, because Star Trek is no longer Star Trek. I have talked about this in my video of the same name, and there is a link to that video in my description box below. For classic film to TV, I usually stick to a period from about 1900 to 1980, and that's because the period after that is pretty well documented. However, 1900 to 1980 contains a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that is not documented, so part of the reason I do the show is to document it. I go into far more depth than any other reviewer. I don't just say if I like the film or not. I don't just walk through the plot saying this or that was good. I go into the acting, the direction, the cinematography, and the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this because a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor so I can speak with a modicum of authority. Not as much as a modern working actor, I never want to give that impression, but with some authority. There is an old saying, those who can do, and those who can't teach. So I suppose that doing reviews is, means I probably can't. <laughs> One thing I don't do is outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers who are simply actors portraying outrage because they found out after The Last Jedi that outrage sells. They hate everything with a knee-jerk reflex, and this causes a weird feedback loop between fans and these popular reviewers. Uh, they go back and forth, hating, 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 and eventually nobody likes anything, even if it's any good. But I don't do that. If I like something, I will say why in detail. If I dislike it, I'll say why in detail. I don't do outrage. Unlike the other reviewers, I am the adult in this room. There was a non-spoiler review for Frankenstein 1910. I would say that if you're in, unfamiliar with the era in which this film was made, then you will probably just think of it as, I don't know, something of a novel bit of history inasmuch it was the first time that Mary Shelley's classic novel, Frankenstein, was adapted for film. However, after watching this review and understanding the era and the technology, you'll be able to see it as far more layered and interesting film. Now, you can neither watch nor review older films like this, especially one that's this old, from a modern perspective. As with most of the older films, you must approach it as a viewer of that time, whether you're reviewing it or just watching it. Because a lot has changed in 110 years, and if you don't know the historical context, then you can't really judge it properly. So part of what I do with classic films is try to set the stage a bit. So life in this era. Well, in 1910, the average U.S. wage was 22 cents per hour. But if you adjust that for inflation today, that would be about $5.99, which also isn't that great. The average U.S. worker made between $200 and $400 per year. If you adjusted for inflation, that's anywhere from about $5,500 to $11,000. A competent accountant could be expected to earn about $2,000 per year. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $54,500. A dentist would earn something like 2500 per year, and adjusted for inflation, that's pretty good, at 68000 
A veterinarian could earn anywhere between $1,500 and $4,000 a year, and when adjusted for inflation, that comes out to anywhere between $41,000 and about $109,000 per year. Mechanical engineer, he could make about $5,000 a year, and adjusted for inflation, that's a nice good $136,000. In terms of some of the costs, what you would pay, well, sugar costs four cents a pound, but adjusted for inflation, that's about $1.09 per pound today. Eggs were 14 cents a dozen. In 2020, adjusted for inflation, that would be $3.81 per dozen. Coffee was 15 cents a pound, but adjusted for inflation, again, that is $4.08. The average life expectancy for men in 20, uh, 1910 was 47 years of age. More than 95% of all births took place at home. 90% of all doctors had no college education. Instead, they attended what were called medical schools, but many of them were condemned in the press and by the government as substandard. The tallest structure in the world was the Eiffel Tower. The five leading causes of death were pneumonia and influenza, tuberculosis, diarrhea, heart disease, and a stroke. Crossword puzzles, canned beer, iced tea, all kinds of stuff like that had not been invented yet. There were a lot of things that had not been invented yet. However, marijuana, heroin, and morphine were all available over the counter at the local drugstore. In fact, you can send your child down with a note to buy some. And yet, we didn't have any gangs. That's what happens when you make something legal, when you don't have drug interdiction. It's just something people buy. You don't have death over it. That's why we should end it, a prohibition of drugs, all drugs, right now. We would have no gang problems anymore. Back at the time, pharmacists actually claimed that heroin clears the complexion, gives buoyancy to the mind, regulates stomach and bowels, and is, in fact, a perfect guardian of health. <laughs> in the U.S., there were 54 states. The president was William Howard Taft. The vice president was James S. Sherman. And the speaker of the House of Representatives was Joseph Gurney Cannon. And all of these guys were Republicans. The population at the time, well, the urbanization that had started with industrialization uh, had attained an urban majority between 1910 and 1920. And in 1910, it was about 40% urban, 60% rural. In total, the uh, U.S. population was 92,228,496, with a population density per square mile of about 26 people. New York City had a population of 4,766,883. Chicago had a population of 2,185,283, with Philadelphia coming in third at 1,549,008. Everybody else was significantly less than that, close to half a million at best. Um, in Las Vegas, the population was 30. <laughs> Now, only 14% of homes had a bathtub. Most women only washed their hair once a month and used borax bleach or egg yolks for shampoo. Only 8% of homes had a telephone. There were only 8,000 cars and only 144 miles of paved roads. And the maximum speed limit in most cities was 10 miles per hour. 18% of households had at least one full-time servant or domestic help. There were about 250 reported murders in the entire United States, this despite the fact that anyone could purchase any gun of any kind, whether it was intended for warfare or not. There was no Mother's Day or Father's Day, for that matter, a lot of days that we've come to see later on. Two out of every ten adults couldn't read or write, and only 6% of all Americans had graduated from high school. What you have to understand, however, is education at this time period was geared such that by fifth grade, you would get the same or better education as a modern 12th grader. It was that much more information and that much more difficult. Fifth grade was about as high as anybody got. Sixth grade through 12th grade was considered prep school. That meant that you were singled out as being so intelligent that you could probably go to college 
And so they were preparing you for college in sixth or twelfth grades. But fifth grade was an ordinary place to stop because the amount of information that was being given to you was that much higher. That represents how bad our education system has become in the United States. We are now packing in at least as much as a 12th grader would learn, would learn back then in fifth grade. And in this same year, W.D. Boyce incorporated the Boy Scouts of America on February 8th. Now, ordinarily, I might discuss fashions and way of life, but in preparing for this review, I came across a rather astonishing video by a YouTuber whose name I'm about to get wrong called Denis uh, Shiryaev. Oh, my God. It is called A Trip Through New York City in 1911, and it is a video of various places, you know, where they would shoot just people with cameras on various places in New York. And this guy has upscaled it to 4K and to 60 frames per second, as well as colorizing. Oh, my God, go watch this video. A picture might be worth a thousand words, but this video is worth a thousand or a million pictures. Again, it's called A Trip to New York City in 1911, and there is a link to that in my description box. Go watch that film. You will learn more about the way of life than I could tell you in paragraphs. Now, the story of this film isn't exactly the film, but rather the technology. The film is, after all, only 12 minutes, 45 seconds long, and my review is considerably longer than that. So, what was the technology behind what was going on with this film? The technology used for this film was the Edison Kinetoscope. Now, the Kinetoscope was an early motion picture exhibition device. It was designed for films to be viewed by one individual at a time through a peephole a viewer window at the top, just like this one. You may have seen these around before at uh, you know, museums and stuff. The kinetoscope was not originally a motion picture projector, but introduced the basics, of, uh, a basic approach rather, that would become the standard for all cinematic projection before the advent of video. So the interior of this was very, very interesting. Um, what would happen was they would use rolled film, as you can see here, and uh, th that was originally set up by an uh, inventor in, pa in Paris uh, named Louis Le France. The concept was also used by inventor Thomas Edison, we'll talk about him quite a lot, in 1889 and subsequently developed by his employees in 1889 and 1892. Now, a prototype of the kinetoscope was shown to a convention of the National Federation of Women's Clubs on May 20th, 1891. And the first public de de uh, demonstration was held at the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences on May 9th, 1893. Now, this was instrumental to the birth of American movie culture. And the kinetoscope also had a major impact in Europe. And that's because its influence was magnified by the fact that Edison decided not to seek international patents on the device. And this meant that there were many people who could make them, which meant competition. And competition always means greater quality at lower prices. In 1895, Edison introduced the kinetophone, which joined the kinetoscope with a cylindrical phonograph record. It, it, it predates the circular phonograph records vinyl uh, by quite a long time. Film pro projection, which Edison initially disdained as financial, financially non-viable, soon superseded the kinetoscope's individual ex, you know, model. Instead of just one person, they were projecting it. Now, many of the projection systems developed by Edison's firm and later used would still use this kinetoscope name. And then came this. In 1912, after this film came out, but it's interesting to note this, he introduced the ambitious and rather expensive home projecting kinetoscope. Now, this was a model intended for use in the home. It was a home entertainment device very early. Um, and, it, you know, think about it as a really early video it, it, that's so ubiquitous. But it was um, a commercial failure. Didn't go much. It was probably very expensive, would be my guess. Much of Edison's uh, company's real creative work in the motion picture field from 1897 on involved the use of kinetoscope-related patents in threatened or actual lawsuits for the purpose of financially pressuring or blocking commercial rivals. Edison did that a lot. 
So while Edison oversaw cursory sound cinema experiments after the success of 1903's The Great Train Robbery and other Edison Manufacturing Company productions, it was not until 1908 that he returned in earnest to combine audiovisual concepts that he had first led him to even enter the motion picture field. So he patented a synchronized system that connected a projector and a phonograph located behind the, proje the screen on which it was projected. And then two years later, he supervises a, uh, supervised a press demonstration at the laboratory of his of a sound film system of either this or later design that's kind of lost to history. In 1913, Edison finally introduced the new kinetophone, like all of his sound film exec uh, exhibition systems since the first in the mid 1890s it used this cylindrical um, phonograph was now connected to this projecting cinema uh, kinetoscope and it had a fishing line type belt and series of metal pulleys so that it would keep it in synchronization but it got a lot of acclaim in the short term, but poorly trained operators had trouble keeping the picture in synchronization with the sound. And like the sound film systems of the era, the kinetophone really had not solved the issues of insufficient amplification so that the audience could hear it in a very large theater and unpleasant audio quality. Its drawing power as a novelty soon faded and was a f uh, and when a fire, remember this fire, at Edison's West Orange Complex in December 1914, it destroyed all of the kinetophone image and sound masters. The system was just abandoned. They decided, Edison decided it wasn't worth it anymore. So, Frankenstein would have been screened in live theaters and later possibly on the home projecting kin kinetoscope as a silent film. And it would be screened in a large theater like the one that you can see behind me. This theater is the Rococo Theater in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's sort of the grand dame of uh, old theaters. It is a movie theater that was converted from old, uh, an old uh, live stage theater. They would have, uh, you know, local performing companies. They would have companies that were uh, touring companies that would go there. They would have vaudeville, that sort of thing. That was what that theater was built for. What they did with later when they just converted it out right movies was they just put a screen up in front of this very large um, proscenium that they had. So it might be shown someplace like that. I would be surprised if uh, the Rococo, which at that time would have been, I, I, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure if it was built, but if the Rococo had been around, it would have been in a theater like this. Um, it would have been had music, not music that came with the film, but it would be provided via an orchestra, a pipe organ, or a piano, depending on the size and prestige of a given theater. If it was around at the time, the Rococo here probably would have been at least a pipe organ and probably an actual um, orchestra. Now, Frankenstein was among the early silent films, one of the few that had an associated cue sheet that would be providing suggested musical accompaniment. And the cue sheet survives to this very day. And the cues include music from operas and a few uh, popular songs of that era. Now, for many years, it was believed that Frankenstein was just lost. But in 1963, a plot description and stills were discovered, published from the March 15, 2010, 1910, rather, issue of Edison's film catalog, The Edison Kinetogram. And that's what we're seeing over here. In the early 1950s, a print of this film was purchased by a Wisconsin collector, Alwa F. Detlaff from his mother-in-law who also collected films and he did not realize its rarity for many years later. The existence of this was actually first revealed in the mid-1970s and although somewhat deteriorated the film was in a viewable condition complete with the titles and tints and the tints in this that you see are not screw-ups on the film. It is part of the direction. I'll talk about that in a bit. Dead Laugh had a 35mm preservation copy made in the late 1970s and then released a DVD release of 1,000 copies sometime later than that. Now, Bear Manor Media released the public domain film in a restored edition in 2010 along with the novel Edison's Frankenstein, I think it was a making of, um, and in 2016 the Film Society of the University of Geneva then undertook their own restoration of the film. But then, on November 15th, 2018, in recognition of Mary Shelley's bicentennial in this book, the Library of Congress announced via a blog post that they had completed a full restoration of the short film, having purchased the Detlaff Collection in 2014. 
and it was made available on YouTube and also um, for the general public on YouTube um, or you can download it or you can see it on the National Screening Room website and uh, this is the version that is available on YouTube that I watched for this. It's amazing. It, it not only is it a pretty good copy, never be perked with, with something that old, but it's a pretty good copy, keeps all the tints that are in the film, the various uh, color scheming that you see throughout and all of it, but it also upscales it to 60 frames per second and 1080p. So that's pretty cool. Um, to be honest, I would be very interested to see this film using the music from the original Q Sheep. And unfortunately, I don't know if anyone's undertaking it. Sometime if I have a spare few years, maybe I'll undertake it. <laughs> so finally, at last, we come to the review itself. So we will just take it as read that if you've come to this video looking for a review you've already watched, Frankenstein 1910, or you just don't care if it's spoiled for you. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert. And that is because I am a fan die master. And that means that the fandom is strong with me. And this is not a boast or a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. But the problem with fan die masters is the, that we are cursed. You just can't see all this new stuff for out seeing the century that came before. You discover that there's just very little that's original, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things. Um, in this film, I was not particularly spoiled about it. You know, it didn't particularly... I mean, you have to know the general concept behind Frankenstein, but this one is so not quite an adaptation of the Frankenstein novel that you could still be a little surprised by what's going on. So the plot of this film now, it's very interesting. The plot, the most interesting version of it, comes from the Edison Kinetograph, uh, which was published uh, as part of the library of Edison Films. Now, what would happen was theaters would look at this library, as in the Edison Kinetograph, and they would see it and decide whether they wanted prints in order to screen in their theaters. But the, f the, the plot listed here is actually kind of almost longer than the film itself. Um, but this is what the plot read. This is what they're trying to actually get across in this film in case you didn't get it. Frankenstein, a young student, is seen bidding his sweetheart and father goodbye as he is leaving home to enter college in order to study the sciences. Shortly after his arrival at college, he becomes absorbed in the mysteries of life and death to the extent of forgetting practically everything else. His great ambition is to create a human being, and finally one night his dream is realized. He is convinced that he has found a way to create the most perfect human being known to the world, and we see this experiment commence and the development of it. The formation of the hideous monster from the blazing chemicals of a huge cauldron in Frankenstein's laboratory is probably the most weird, mystifying, and fascinating scene ever shown on a film. To Frankenstein's horror, instead of creating a marvel of physical beauty and grace, there is be unfolded before his eyes and before the audience an awful, ghastly, abhorrent monster. As he realizes what he has done, Frankenstein rushes from the room only to have the misshapen monster peer at him through the curtains of his bed. He falls, fainting to the floor, where he is found by his servant who revives him. After a few weeks' illness, Frankenstein returns home a broken, weary man, but under the loving care of father and sweetheart, he regains his health and strength and begins to take a less morbid view of life. In other words, the story of the film brings out the fact that the creation of the monster was only possible because Frankenstein had allowed his normal mind to be overcome by evil and unnatural thoughts. His marriage is soon to take place, but one evening, while sitting in his library, he chances to glance in the mirror before him and sees the reflection of the monster which has just opened the door of his room. All the terror of the past comes rushing over him, and fearing lest his sweetheart should learn the truth, he bids the monster conceal himself behind the curtain, while he hurriedly introduces his sweetheart, who then comes in to stay only for a moment. Then follows a strong, dramatic scene. The monster, who is following his creator with the devotion of a dog, is insanely jealous of anyone else. 
He snatches from Frankenstein's coat the rose which his sweetheart has given him, and in the struggle throws Frankenstein to the floor. And here the monster looks up and for the first time confronts his own reflection in the mirror. Appalled and horrified at his own image, he flees in terror from the room. Not being able, however, to live apart from his creator, he comes again to the house and on the wedding night and, searching for the cause of his jealousy, goes into the bride's room. Frankenstein, coming into the main room, hears a shriek of terror, which is followed a moment after by his bride rushing in and falling in a faint at his feet. The monster then enters, and after overpowering Frankenstein's feeble efforts by a slight exercise of his gigantic strength, leaves the house. And here comes the point which we have endeavored to bring out, namely, that when Frankenstein's love for his bride shall have attained full strength and freedom from impurity, it will have such an effect upon his mind that the monster cannot exist. The theory is clearly demonstrated in the next and closing scene, which has probably never been surpassed in anything shown on the moving picture screen. The monster, broken down by his unsuccessful attempts to be with his creator, enters the room, stands before a large mirror, and holds out his arms entreatingly. And gradually, the real monster fades away, leaving only the image in the mirror. A moment later, Frankenstein himself enters. As he stands directly before the mirror, we are amazed to see the image of the monster reflected instead of Frankenstein's own. Gradually, however, under the effect of love and his better nature, the monster's image fades and Frankenstein sees himself in his young manhood in the mirror. His bride joins him, and the film ends with their embrace with Frankenstein's mind now being relieved of the awful horror and weight it has been so laboring under for so long. And scene. As I say, the one in the Edison kinetograph is rather amazingly long. So the Edison kinetogram is considerably, again, more informative than the film itself, and I'm unclear that the audience would necessarily have grasped the various themes at play if they'd not read this entry from the Edison kinetogram. So, we talk about cringe moments. I will often say about things that, uh, you know, were bad with the film, because I have a lot of great moments. But the film this old, made in an era that might as well be an alien society to modern viewers, there is a temptation to simply laugh or deride it. But to do so without the context and the technology of that era would be completely unfair. Consequently, I can give this film no real cringe moments, but must instead focus on the more novel aspects of the filmmaking, because this was very, very early on in the film uh, process. They were really just starting to explore what you could do with film as a visual medium. And they did a few things here that were very, very novel. So for great moments, the greatest moments in the film involve the direction, and I'll go about that in depth when I talk about the direction. But one thing to note, it is, while it's certainly not even remotely a faithful adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel, but then again, there have never been, except for one instance, uh, anything like a remote adaptation. There was one movie made, not the Universal Horror Movies, not the Hammer Horror Movies, none of them. There was a 1994 Frankenstein version directed by Kenneth Branagh and starring Robert De Niro as the monster, and that is a good, faithful adaptation. However, the film doesn't even pretend to be a faithful adaptation. It says in the first title card that it is a liberal adaptation, and that's what it is. It is not being very, you know, straight up with it, so... I always talk about the writers first, because without a writer, you ain't got no script. The writers credited are Mary Shelley, first and foremost, because, of course, she wrote this novel. Mary Shelley was with us from 1797 until 1851, died at the age of 54. She was an English novelist, most famous for, of course, the 1818 novel Frankenstein or The Modern Prometheus. The book is in the public domain, by the way. You can find it on Project Gutenberg for free, and I have left a link to it in my description box below. If you are a fan die Padawan, or even a fan die master who has not yet read this book, you should. It is one of the classics. Chelsea also uh, edited and promoted the works of her husband, the romantic poet and philosopher, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Her father was a political philosopher. Her mother was also a philosopher and a feminist. 
and she's credited here solely due to the source material, as again the film bears only a superficial relationship to the actual novel. The real guy we can blame for the story here, and the director, is J. Searle Dolly. He was with us from 1877 to 1949, died at the age of 71. His IMDb shows him active from 1909 to 1926 with 182 director credits, 40 writer credits, 1 cinematographer credits, and he did a large number of shorts because that was the nature of filmmaking early cinema. Things were, you know, about 15 minutes long. But in later years, as, you know, long features started to come along, multi-real features, he would direct some of those. And he won no awards, but again... No film awards existed at the time that this film was made. <laughs> in terms of the writing, uh, as it mentioned in the opening title card, this is a liberal adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel. Now, in 1910, given the technology of that time, it would have been completely impossible to film a true good adaptation. As I said, Universal's Frankenstein film franchise never did it. The Hammer films never did it. That credit solely belongs to the 1994 movie. So it is an extremely liberal adaptation. It really shares nothing more than character names, a monster, and a little tiny bit of a thematic, you know, understone. But if you consider it an early character study, it's pretty good for its era. It would be, frankly, difficult for me to rate the script. I have to sit back and think, what would this be like if I were watching it in 1910 without... 110 years of film history afterwards. This would have been very new, something you'd never seen in a theater. If I was rating it as a 1910 reviewer, I would probably give it a 10 out of 10. And modern viewers who don't watch this film, knowing the era and the technology in which it was made, would probably rate it lower. In fact, I'm going to show you that they have. However, as an informed reviewer, and now you as an informed viewer, i got to rate this pretty high. Then there's the direction, and this is really where the film shines. I give it a 10 out of 10 for direction. So again, modern viewers here might find it quaint, but Dolly did a couple of very interesting things that not seen in films of that era. Completely new stuff. Again, they were experimenting, starting to experiment with what you could do with film as a visual medium. And it, doing this would have made it a lot more dramatic for a 1910 audience. Now today... The direction seems kind of flat. It's just a series of static master shots in which all of the action occurs totally uninterrupted. But you have to remember, this was a convention of that era. Again, filmmaking was an entirely new art form with its own rules, and they had only started to really experiment with the, what those rules were. It took directors several decades to really take advantage of what you can do with a camera visually. So consequently, early films tended to be made in the same style as a play. The camera was just pointed on a set, and the actors entered and exited exactly as you'd expect in a stage play. See, you can't fault both the director or the cinematographer with this. It was a convention of that era, exactly what audiences would have expected. Again, they were only just starting to experiment with what you could do with film as a visual medium. At the time, they just said, let's use it like a play. However, there's also another very innovative thing that audiences definitely would have noticed as being innovative. And it was the use of the color filters for different scenes. And they're unique. They're not, that's not something bad with the film. Those color filters are in there on purpose, and they are unique. There are several, and they all indicate the general mood for a given scene, and they also symbolize emotion and character. And, of course, the other very innovative thing in this film is the mirror in Frankenstein's study at home. And today we would be able to do this easily. But at that time, it was very, very novel, and it's used in two different ways that would have been considered completely new for an audience of 1910. Now, the first is its placement. It allows the viewer to see a character entering by looking at them in the mirror rather than seeing them enter a scene as you would expect to in a play in the opposite direction. And remember, this was shot like a stage play, so doing that was pretty damn novel. The second use is, of course, the special effect at the end. And that would have been completely new. Nobody had done that. Now, just at that time, nobody even, even 
tried that special effect. And while it would be very, very easily accomplished today, we're just talking about a fade out and stuff, it would have been totally new for, from the perspective of a 1910 audience. They probably would have been, that's amazing. So in terms of the direction, I can give that sucker easily. Looking at this as a 1910 audience member, I can give that a 10 out of 10. Now there are the characters, but I have to give you just a little bit of information about that beforehand. You see, there was a different style of acting, and it was called declamatory acting. It was the common style of performance by actors for literally centuries before the early 20th century. Now in declamatory acting, emotions were expressed through very grand gestures and very good eloquation and editorial projection in order to get things across. But many of these gestures, believe it or not, were actually standardized poses that were well known to the audience as well as the actor. And in some ways it was like a ballet. Actors were not judged on the realism of their acting or the portrayal of the character necessarily, but rather by their effective uses of these poses and oratory. You know, that's how they did it. This style was ultimately replaced by the Stanislavski method acting in the 1920s. It was much better suited, certainly, for film. And this type of acting, method acting, is still largely in use today, though with some variations from Stanislavski's original ideas. Method acting is best known for the general question, what's my motivation? And this is, what this means is, a what is the character trying to achieve and why at any given moment in the play or video or whatever? Because human beings always have reasons for everything that we do. So method acting attempts to determine character motivations. Why are we doing this thing? Why does my character want this? Within the context of any given play, TV, film, or TV show, and it could vary from moment to moment. Why does my character say this thing? Why does my character do this thing? It has to make sense internally as a motivation for why they would do it. And probably the most well-known method actor of the 20th century was Marlon Brando. But until the 1920s, we see this declamatory acting in films, and we definitely see it here. It looks fake and theatrical from a modern perspective, but audiences of that era of 1910 would have been judging the performances based largely on these poses. There was no you know, great elocution and auditory in a film, but they would certainly be, you know, what are these people doing with poses and what does it mean? And they would be judging those actors based on the poses. It is, however, because of this, essentially impossible for me to judge any of the acting in the film. I am totally, basically unfamiliar with these movements. I've seen them once or twice in books, and, but I don't really know exactly what they're trying to convey. And from a modern perspective, it seems melodramatic in the extreme. So I'm not going to try to review the acting. I'm just going to tell you about the actors. Now keep in mind that while their INDBs may show a lot of work, these were basically stage actors and they would have been making their living on the stage. And of course there are no awards here because at that time there were no film awards whatsoever. So as a Frankenstein himself, we have Augustus Phillips. He was with us 1874. You know, I get a kick out of some of these guys. They were there during what we might call the Wild West. 1874 to 1952, dying at the age of 78. His IMDb lists him active as 1910 to 1921, during which he had 160 actor credits in film. Frankenstein was, in fact, his very first gig in film. He was probably doing stage work long before that. And he did largely shorts like Frankenstein until 1916, and that's about when multi-reel feature films started to become more common, and he did some multi-reel features after that. He did a lot of different genres, played a lot of leading men, and the fact that he left film in 1921 may be indicative that he could not adapt to the new method acting style because many stage actors at that time used to this and this and this. They could never adapt, and they just ended up stopping working. Now, as Elizabeth Frankenstein's intended, we have Mary Fuller. She was with us 1888. Again, man... Wild West age, 
1973 and died at the age of 85. Her IMDb shows her active from 1907 to 19, 1917 with 226 film acting credits. They were all for shorts as they were, those were the only things that produced in that era. She had numerous genres generally playing ingenue type leading ladies. And what may have happened to her in terms of not acting after that period is she may have aged out. This is a massive problem for Hollywood actresses. You get known and have a face for being like an ingenue, like she is. And then you get old to, too old to play ingenues. And so you never work again. It is really hard for actresses to find work if they have been known as an ingenue of a certain age. They just age out. And she also, she may have been unable to adapt to the new method acting style. Could be either one of those things. Could be both. I don't know. As the monster, the third actual character that we care about in this film and is actually credited, is Charles Ogle. He was with us from 1865, man, to uh, 1940, died at the age of 70. His IMDb lists him active as 1908 to 1926, and yet despite only being in the industry for 18 years, I'm, he racked up. 327 actor credits. I think that this is a show record for the number of acting credits that anybody's had. And he did all shorts until 1917. Again, that's when doing multi-reel features came along, and he was able to do some of those as well. In terms of the production itself, well, here we get to a very interesting one because this was produced by Thomas Edison, the inventor. Uh, he was with us from 1847 to 1931. Again, guy lived through a whole bunch of interesting stuff in American history. He is generally hailed as one of the greatest inventors of all time, inventors of all time, and he certainly was. However, as his success grew, he employed many different engineers and technicians in his company, many of whom were responsible for the inventions that are actually attributed to him. Edison was, above all else, a businessman with an eye toward emerging technologies and a knack for employing those who could bring those technologies to life. His closest modern equivalent might be Steve Jobs. While hailed for numerous modern technologies, it wasn't Jobs himself who performed the work. He didn't sit down and do all the soldering. He gave some general direction about what he wanted these technologies to look like. And then he hired other people, very talented individuals, who could make those technologies a reality. Edison's IMDb shows him active from 1893 to 1914 with 47 producer credits, all of which were shorts. They ranged from dramas like Frankenstein to many, many documentaries. He had five director credits, all of which were for documentaries. And he has 12 self-credits in which he appeared in news and documentary films explaining some aspect of a technology he was developing or had already developed. In terms of the production itself, I could find absolutely no budget figures whatsoever. Uh, it should certainly be noted that Edison had little to no involvement with Frankenstein. He certainly greenlit the production and he funded it, but that was really all. He, he wasn't sitting around on set all day. And there are also no profit figures for this film. Given what I've said about the novelty of some of the things that happened in this film, I'd actually have to assume that it was pretty popular. You know, some of the stuff, special effects that they were seeing here look fake and phony by today's standards. But back then, you know, it would have been like watching a modern CGI-filled uh, film. That, you know, those two scenes, the one with the monster being created and then merging into the mirror and all that, that would have been a huge, huge deal back then. The production itself was uh, filmed in uh, three to four days at the Edison Studios in the Bronx, New York City. The production was deliberately designed to de-emphasize the horrific aspects of the story and focus on the story's mystical and psychological elements. And in fact, in a press statement, the production stated, in making the film, the Edison Company has carefully tried to eliminate all actual repulsive and uh, situations and concentrate its endeavors upon the mystic and psychological problems that are to be found in the weird tale. Whenever, therefore, the film differs from the original story, it is purely with the idea of elimination of what would be repulsive to a motion picture audience. 
The film does have, fortunately for us, a credited cinematographer. I could not find any pictures of him. I do not know how long he was with us or when he was born or died. He's a very interesting guy. Now, his IMDb only lists Frankenstein, but he shot an enormous number of other things for Edison. In 1897, James White, he was the head then of the Edison Company's Kinetograph Department. And at that time, he and photographer Frederick Bletchenden made a filming expedition to the west part of the United States, the part that was at that time the least populated. And the trip now was partially subsidized by various railways, so they filmed the scenes of various railway lines, hotels, tourist traps along the way. And the routes that White and Bletchenden in took included <laughs> the Northern Pacific Railroad, the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, and the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroads. Some of the scenes that White and Bletchenden filmed included views of everyday life in San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, Yellowstone National Park, and Native Americans in Colorado and New Mexico. And you have to understand, when they're capturing this stuff, it might seem like just pointing your, you know, your phone at something and taking uh, videos would be better, and it would. But this was the first time anyone had done this and then shown it in theaters for public consumption. They also captured activities related to the Alaska Gold Rush in Seattle in August of 1897. And in the same year, they also traveled on the Mexican International Railroad to two films selected places in Mexico. You have to understand this is a big, big deal. Audiences of that time, you know, most people even today, you don't, you born, live, and die within about a 200-mile radius of where you were born. People had never seen this stuff. They would never travel to see this. You couldn't just go on a vacation to Mexico. It was impossible because of the technology of the time. You either lived near Mexico or you didn't. So these guys were seeing this stuff for the very first time. So these two photographers, they then journeyed to Japan, Hong Kong, China, and Hawaii, and they recorded the first Edison-produced films of the Asian Pacific. Again, somewhere that no one no one was ever going to go to. So this was a big deal. And in an attempt to find even more varied film subjects, the Edison Company recorded places and events all around the world. And James White, he traveled to Europe to produce a series of films on the Paris Exposition of 1900. Large-scale disasters were a big subject for the Edison camera. The Galveston hurricane in 1900 and the San Francisco earthquake and fire in 1906 were two instances where their cameras recorded destruction for the viewers far away from those locales. If you didn't live in San Francisco, Southern California, you would never have seen it. Big, big deal. The Edison Company produced a series of films of the Pan American Exposition in 1901 at Buffalo, New York, where their cameras were there during a very huge news event, the assassination of President McKinley, and also recorded events after the assassination, including the funeral processions. Again, stuff that no one would ever see. At best, they might have seen a photograph in a newspaper. But here, Edison was able to offer this stuff directly to the public. Today, nothing. Point your camera, put it on YouTube. But back then, this was incredible. It was exposing people to places and ideas and things that they would never otherwise see in their lives. So by 1902, what they called actualities, which is when they were shooting what amounted to pieces of documentary photograph, it started to decline in popularity. So they started doing longer fiction films because it became a priority because the novelty of just movement on screen was not enough to sustain audience interests. You have to remember, having a moving image on the screen initially shocked audiences. It's like you can compare it to modern CGI. Sometimes it is astonishing. You look at it and go, my God, how did they do that? You know, Avatar. It may seem like nothing now, but even seeing movement on the screen was a huge, huge deal. But it eventually started to wane. After a while, it's like anything else. You see CGI today, you don't even think twice about it. So they would continue, Edison's company would do occasionally take actualities, films of various news events and of persons, but it would never do so again to the extent that it had in its first decade of the filmmaking. 
Other smaller companies took over this niche by creating newsreels, as the Edison Company, along with other major film producers, concentrated on creating profitable fiction films. Now, the music that you hear in the version that's on YouTube that was released by the uh, Library of Congress, this actually has a modern composer attached to it. It's Donald Sosin. He was born in 1951 and is still with us. His IMDb <laughs> lists him as active from 1910 to 2015, giving him a 105-year career. However, his real career actually begins in 1998. He was subsequently, after that, hired to score older, generally silent films or films with a very limited score from an early era. And those films range anywhere from 1910, which Frankenstein, to 1934-ish. He other ha otherwise has 40 composer credits, 17 music department credits, and one soundtrack credit, and has so far won no awards. In terms of the soundtrack that he provides here, I am at this point completely ambivalent about this music. Um, it's forgettable. You know, it, it underscores the action. Um, don't want to take anything away from what he was doing. It underscores the action. But that's really about it. It's a piano. It is an attempt to do what you would have seen in a piano score, what might have been consistent with a smaller 1910 theater. Remember, they used to have orchestras and then pipe organs and then pianos in that order, depending on how big and how uh, well-known the theater was. Um, so this would have been piano for something that lacked a orchestra or pipe organ. I'm giving it a 5 out of 10. Um, I'm really, I would really, really be a lot more interested in seeing a version of the film that used the actual original recommended cues. That shouldn't be impossible. I hope somebody does it. <laughs> The set designer on this is completely unknown. They didn't anywhere near credit most of the people involved in films like this. Um, I would talk about this in terms of the period sets. The sets are period sets. It's the sort of thing that you might see in that era. You know, late 18th, early, I mean, 19th, early 20th century. They're consistent with upscale places. You know, uh, it's what you might see. They're very consistent with what you do with a stage set. Again, we're just starting in this period to even think about doing some interesting things on screen. The two that they have here, are uh, three, are really pretty astonishing. So when you see these sets, they may look crude, but they are generally very well decor decorated, especially the ones when Frankenstein is at uh, college because they've got, you know, <laughs> I think an average person watching that could not have been, you know, today it looks melodramatic. But back then, I don't think there could be anything except very creeped out by the fact that, you know, Frankenstein has skulls, skeletons, bones and stuff around his, you know, various places that he is. I think your average audience member would have been completely creeped out by that. And so that's very good in terms of the, the sets. Um, other sets that appear like, you know, Frankenstein's home and stuff like that. Again, period sets of the time. Look crude by today's standards, but they were consistent with what you would see on a uh, stage play. The audience of that time would not have found anything objectionable by that. So... Um, in terms of the special effects, we don't have the slightest clue who they are. Um, there are two, of course, main effects in film, the primary one being the creation of the monster. And this was accomplished, if you couldn't see it, and you probably could, by filming a puppet that was being melted and then flipping it around and showing it in reverse. While this may seem crude today, and we could accomplish it very easily and it would look kind of stupid if you put it in today's films, this effect would have been extremely new, and I suspect that it would probably be terrifying to viewers of that era, because audience expectations were informed by what was possible in theater, live stage, and this would have been completely impossible in live stage. Again, you're dealing with an era when people were just amazed to see something moving on the screen, and then we see this monster being created. They didn't know how it was done, so it would have probably been really terrifying. And the puppet itself isn't badly crafted. I mean, if you were going to do it today, you'd do something much larger. But still, we're talking about a skeleton on which it certainly appears that the parts are just coming up out of this cauldron and filling onto itself. 
Um, you know, again, very cheap effect to do today, but back then, probably just terrifying. The other effect, of course, involves the monster and the mirror. Also, I think something that would people would be, wow, what the, how did they do that? Again, compare it to modern CGI. You know, you, you, at first, it was amazing. Today, we just take it for granted. But back then, it, this was like modern CGI for the first time. Just amazing. It's like, it'd be like going to watch Jurassic Park. You just go, holy crap, the dinosaurs. Um, back then, it was, holy crap, the monster being created. And then, oh, holy crap, the monster disappearing into the mirror and then disappearing completely. That's just amazing. So good effects. 10 out of 10 from the perspective of, you know, that time period. In terms of costume design, we also don't have any idea who created the costumes. Somebody did, but they were period costumes. My regular viewers will get sick of hearing me say this, but I always say it for the benefit of new viewers. A costume should always tell you something about the character. So, for example, if you saw me on the street today, I would be wearing, what the heck was I wearing, a NASA t-shirt and my uh, jeans. That'll tell you I'm kind of a geeky guy. What I'm wearing here is a costume. No one I have ever met in the upper Great Plains of North America wears this. Um, this is a costume because I'm attempting to give a certain type of, um, you know, uh, image. And somebody who might, you know, make a totally different choice in terms of what they wear that would tell you something about them. So the costuming here is good for that. It is telling you things about the character. They are upscale. You do not see anybody in rags. Even the servants are wearing appropriate servant type clothing, upscale, you know, jacket, tie. And, uh, you know, when you see the, uh, the uh, wedding night, uh, Elizabeth the Bride is wearing, you know, very consistent for that period, upscale bridal gown. So all of this, again, tells you something about the costumes. They were just generally period costumes from the late, you know, 1900s to early 2000s. I'm sorry, uh, the, the uh, late 1800s to early 1900s. But they do tell you something about the character. They work as, they, as they're supposed to. I don't think there's anything in there that's generally really, um, you know, breakout and incredible. But I would still give it, um, you know, 8 out of 10, something like that, in terms of being good co costumes. They tell something about the character. Makeup is also totally unknown. And, of course, there's two different types of makeup here. One is just the period makeup itself. Thing to notice on this, your audience's expectation were informed by what was possible in plays. And plays, you have to put in a fair amount of makeup. And then that's just because you have to be able to be seen. You don't want to look washed out. What I do with my lighting here is set up rather specifically so that I don't have to use makeup and still look good. But on a stage, you have to do makeup just so that you don't look washed out. You, you know, you have to do additional makeup around the eyes that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, you know, and it has to be big enough so that not only can the first row see it, but also the 50th row back can see it. They didn't do that here. A lot of times in these early movies, you do see a lot of makeup that's consistent with plays. But they didn't do that here. They did a minimal amount of makeup for the average person, and that was a really good choice to make. Again, they're just starting to fool around with what's possible in motion pictures. So doing different makeup than plays was actually something that was experimental. And, of course, we have the monster. Um, today, the monster looks very, very fake, hokey-looking, kind of stupid. But back then, that makeup was totally new. Completely 100% new. Nobody had ever done makeup like that before. I think that the audience would have been completely terrified by this monster. I think it would have been very terrifying for them. Not horrifying, necessarily. Not something they'd find disgusting. But probably very terrifying. You know, again, nothing to see today, but looking at it from 1910, when they were just experimenting with this stuff, first time this sort of thing had ever been put to screen, I think the audience would have been terrified. I'd give that particular makeup 10 out of 10. Now there's reception on this. What did the audiences actually think about it at the time? Well, unfortunately, both the audience and critic reaction appears to be completely lost to history. I suppose if you were pouring through microfiche for like the New York Times, you could probably find reviews, but I couldn't find anything online. Today, um, the uh, Rotten Tomatoes lists this as 55%. This seems to me low, but it's probably due to modern audiences having difficulty seeing this film through the lens of 1910. And hopefully, 
by now at the end of this review, you as my audience can look at this film from 1910 and say, okay, if there was nothing after this, we've had, we had no century or more of film and TV and video, what would this look like? If I was coming off of just seeing live stage, what would this look like? And I think you can say, okay, the film itself, if you were looking at it from a 1910 perspective, I think it would be a 10 out of 10. So at the end of any review, we ask ourselves, is it any good? Yes, particularly if you understand the era in which it was made, it's a 10 out of 10. At the very least, it can be enjoyed as a piece of history. It was the earliest, albeit liberal, adaptation of Frankenstein to screen. Again, I give the film a 10 out of 10. And that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So a little bit of ad copy, as always, in the immortal style of Ernie Anderson, badly, one of those voiceover guys you always used to hear. Ad copy for my next stuff. So, next time on the Fandime Masters Review... 20th anniversary of Star Trek Digital Ghost. In this German fan film, two Starfleet officers are assigned to test the next generation of fully automated vessels, the USS Enterprise HC. Now, Commander Stanley and Lieutenant Odyssey must contend with the Enterprise HC's holographic automated intelligence. That's next time on the Van Dyme Master's 20th Anniversary Review of Star Trek Digital Ghost. So, thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. The ultimate world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.